Welcome to the Do More Podcast, where we share strategies and tips for improving your life in every aspect. Here's your host, John Farling. All right, welcome back. Today, I've got a buddy of mine uh, that's actually somewhat local to me, Central Ohio, Seth Teagle. Excited to hear more about his story, know a little bit about him, but uh, I know he was a fireman. Uh, he's a real estate investor, and I know he's in a couple different asset classes. So, well, Seth, welcome to the show. Why don't you give us a little background about yourself? Hey, John. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, like as you said, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, or at least that's where we're based out of right now. Uh, quick down and dirty background was I was a fireman for uh, firefighter paramedic for 22 years. Uh, I got into real estate in 2014, 2015-ish, uh, and really got into it just trying to to get some time back because I had, at that time I was working a ton of overtime and wasn't home a lot and was trying to find another stream of income or, or to do something and uh, got into that, worked for somebody for a couple of years before I bought my first property and the, you know, the, I, I jumped right into a commercial multifamily for my first property because, because of what I was trying to do, I had to go bigger than go smaller. And so I just kind of took the leap and that was kind of how I got started. Yeah. So you said in the same time as me around 2014, 15. So do you like looking back, do you remember one single thought or circumstance that happened that was like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a firefighter. You're obviously, you know, helping the community. You're doing great work, but something had to trigger where it was like, I got to do more here. Yeah. So for me, the year that it was really pivotal was I had, you know, I've been, I had been married for what, six years, maybe at that time we had one child and we were getting ready to have twins. And the year that I really realized that I had to do something was my, you know, wife and I were just, it was, we were arguing a lot. It was just, it was kind of crazy at home, but we, when we reflected at the end of the year, we realized that it was, that it was crazy because I was working so much overtime that I had worked uh, six solid months out of 12 at the firehouse. And it was all in preparation of the twins coming, of getting the house ready, of, you know, just preparing for all of that stuff. And I thought, man, you know, the, the, if I want this to, if I want to continue doing this where I don't end up divorced, because I mean, obviously the first responders and, and military are, are the, the average divorce rate is high, way higher than the normal public. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that was just never what I wanted to have happen. So I really tried to figure out what, what can I do to, to be better or to do better. And around that time, I reconnected with a guy I went to college with uh, through social media. And when I went to the fire service, he went into real estate. We were roommates at the time. Um, and then I thought he was going in to be a realtor, which is how he originally started. But when I reconnected with him, he wasn't a realtor anymore. He was a real estate investor, hard money lender, house flipper. He was doing mobile home parks. Like he was doing all this crazy stuff that I was like, you know, how did you go from the guy that I knew to this multimillionaire doing all this stuff in the, in the same time period that here I had a great career going, I was enjoying it. I was, you know, helping the public, I was helping people, you know, having a good impact, but this guy completely changed his story through real estate. And so I reached out to him and I was like, you know, what did you do? And he gave me three things to, to, to do after our initial conversation was read the book, rich dad, poor dad, which, you know, mm -hmm. most real estate investors have, have all read it or, or talk about it. Um, he said he started attending local real estate meetups and try to network and meet other investors and just sit in the corner and listen. Like, don't say anything. You don't know anything, but listen to these other normal people and listen to their stories and, and what they've done. And you'll start to understand that, like, if they can do it, you can do it, too. And then the third thing he said was you have to find a local mentor because he was in Florida. Mm -hmm. I'm in Ohio. And, you know, it just wasn't going to work. He's in a completely different market than I was. And he was so much further advanced than I was. You know, it was really hard. You know, I look back at now and he was gracious with me to even discuss some of the beginner level stuff with me because I just had so many questions. But, you know, I did exactly what he told me. And that was really where I start to see things in my life change, where I realized that this could be something bigger than just a hobby or a side hustle. Um, and again, going back to my original why it was to to get more time where I could spend with my family and not have to be on the truck working all the time, you know, I realized I had to go bigger uh, in real estate in order for that to happen. So that was what pushed me to to go into bigger multifamily projects. That's awesome. It's always interesting to me that that turning point when someone's, they're doing something else and then they're like, you know what, I want more out of my life or 
what whatever that is more money obviously with you um more freedom um it's just really interesting to me so i know now you've got a partner so what was your first step from there you talk to your mentor basically yeah so i attended real estate meetups uh met a couple i met a, a gentleman that ultimately ended up being the first investor with me um but through those meetups i met the a gentleman named steve and he was a contractor that was in my local area he was flipping houses and he had started this construction company so that he could he could stay busy enough to keep a full-time crew or, or multiple crews and so they could be flipping houses for him but then he could also be doing some kind of um, residential, like bathroom remodels, kitchen remodels, whatever. And it would just always keep them, the guys busy in between his flips. And when I met him, he was the first real person I met locally that was doing, that was investing. And I was, was lucky enough to get him to like, Hey, let's go grab a beer. Let's go, you know, grab dinner. And I just wanted to learn like, what, what, how did you do this? You know, like, cause I know he had left his career as an architect and now as a full-time house flipper and gotten into, you know, became a GC and through that conversation, one thing that I kept hearing him mention, and he was, it was like more subtly was that he, he he wanted to expand his flipping business, but he couldn't find somebody to manage his product projects that he could trust because he had gone through like four or five people and it just was never working out. And I thought, well, you know what, I've had a pretty good background in construction and, and like the fire code, building code, like all those kinds of things, dealing with inspectors uh, through my career. So I thought, I said, Hey, you know, I've got, I work 24 hour shift. I got two days off instead of working overtime. Let me come work for you. Just teach me what you know and how to get into this and how to, you know, basically your systems and processes on, on what you do. And that education was more valuable to me than the money that I was losing because I knew that at the end of it, I would have every, the knowledge I needed to be able to execute and be successful in real estate because that was one of my big fears in the beginning was if I got it wrong and I put money out there or, you know, I lost it, you know, it would bankrupt my family. Like the, the money that I first used to invest was a home equity line of credit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't have a ton of cash in the bank, but I had a lot of equity in a home that we had been in for 10 years and it appreciated really well. And, you know, I tapped into that and pulled my first hundred thousand dollars out to use towards an investment. But again, I a hundred thousand dollars isn't going to buy you an apartment building. And again, going back to my why, of time freedom, I knew that I had to be, I had to buy something big enough that I could afford to pay somebody to manage it. And, you know, initially I thought I would do the work, but I quickly learned after I bought it that <laughs> it was going to be too much work and too, you know, you had to move quicker and I couldn't, I couldn't go in and renovate all these apartments by myself. Uh, but the, originally my original plan is that that's what it was, was that I would, I would mainly do the contracting work. I could do flooring. I could do drywall. I could do that kind of stuff. Um, but I knew that if I could buy this apartment complex, I'd have enough cash flow to pay a management company. There'd be cash flow left over. And the investor that I had kind of mentioned earlier that I met through the meetup, the pitch that I gave him was, look, you've never done a cash out refi on some of your rentals. You've got four or $500,000 of equity in these rentals. You know, have you ever thought about going bigger? And he had, but it just was never like, it never was obtainable. Obtain, uh, I can't even say it obtainable in his mind. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked about it, I said, look, you know, I walked him through all the things I'd learned and studied um, during my time working for Steve. So I ended up working for him for about a year and a half, two years. So I learned a ton from him, both good, bad, uh, what not to do, what to do, realized in that time frame that flipping was basically another job. There were some deals where he did really, really well on, but then there's other deals where he lost money. And then there were some deals where he broke even. And so if you, you know, if you look at the net proceeds that he gained in those two years, it was okay, but I was better off working overtime to get the guaranteed money than to do what he was doing. So like I said, that kind of helped push me to do something bigger. And as I was talking to this investor, you know, I basically said, look, if you'll do a cash out refi, I'll go find something that will not only support me, but will support the cash flow that you're giving up. Because obviously by him doing a cash out refi, he's going to, his his cash flow to him monthly, which is what he was using to live on. He was in his mid sixties. It couldn't change. So that was kind of the deal. If you can find something that will provide enough cash flow to make up the difference, I'll do it. And then I'll invest with you. And that's what I did. So I, I found a 50 unit uh, that I believed would cash flow enough to be able to pay uh, him. And it didn't pay me right away, but you know, like I said, after a year of working on it, when we refinanced it, you know, I made more money uh, doing that for a year than I was going to probably make in the next five or six years at the firehouse. So it was, 
you know, it was, it was a proven concept at that time. And then I just, we just scaled it from there. That's awesome. That's awesome. There, there's a ton of stuff there. I want to back up a, a little bit. Um, you were smart enough and probably curious enough to, uh, well, I don't want to answer your question, but you reached out to a couple of different people and uh, this guy, Steve, you're like, Hey, I'll come work for you. If you basically teach me the ropes, what do you think? Ha- what do you think's in you to do that? That other people, because I know you've seen, you know, people trying to break into the space too. Most people don't reach out to people and will come and say, "Hey, you're the expert. Let me learn from you." Most people don't do that. So, what do you think is in you that made you want to do that? Uh, I, you know, it's I don't want to say that I'm like dr- more driven than other people. I just think that when I have, you know, whether it's to a fault depending on what the topic is. But when I set my mind to something like there's just nobody or nothing that's going to get in my way of of making that happen. And when I realized that I could change the course of my life and my family's life and my legacy, if you will, by making the successful, there was nobody or anything that was going to get my way of not having that happen. And so to me, there was just no other, there was no other option, right? I knew that if I continue to be a fireman and having to continue to to work and, and work all this overtime. Like I knew where that would get me. It'd get me divorced. It'd get me single. It'd get me, you know, I'd have the life that I grew up in that I didn't want for my own kids. That's where it would get me. And so that motivation was just, like I said, that, t- that coupled with the fact that I was just, you know, kind of like take no prisoners kind of thing. I was, this was going to work. I was going to make it work. I was confident in myself. I knew I could handle it. I just needed um, I just needed a break. I needed a footing. I needed somebody to kind of give me some help or at least kind of like crack the door for me. And I think that's really it. You know, I mean, I've had people that, that will, will go out of their way to try to get my attention to where I'll have, you know, I'll meet with them or I'll have a call with them or whatever. And I will give them simple steps to follow. And it's really a test for me to see how committed are they? Because I'm not going to waste my time with you if you're not serious. And like Matt, who was the, the roommate that I had in Florida, you know, he gave me three things to do. Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, go to local meetups and find mentor. You know, I did all of those things in 30 days <laughs> and he realized I was serious. And so there's like, and I'm sure the same thing for you. People reach out to you about storage. Like, you know, I will give them like some simple steps to take. And that immediately derails 90% of the people that want to yeah. come do what I do, or they want to come talk to me about this or whatever. And so, you know, I knew that, that, that if, I mean, I guess I just didn't have any other choice, right? I mean, I could continue doing what I was doing, or I could do something that was, that I believed to be transformational for my entire family. And that was enough motivation for me to go, you know, if Steve would have said no, or if he would have ignored me, I'd have found somebody else, you know, but I was on the hunt to find somebody who could help me. And, And I knew that I was willing to work for free because the education I got, you know, the fire service, it's at least the way that I think is very on the job training, very hands on. I learn better doing that. I retain it better than just reading it in a book. And, you know, I did that education, the podcast and the YouTube and all that, but I, I, you know, I need the hands-on training. And so, yeah, I mean, for me to, it was like a do or die kind of thing. I needed somebody that would, that, that would allow me to get in deep with them and teach me what they knew and see how they did it and see how they budgeted, see how they did their walkthroughs, see how they, they got material, all that stuff so that I could recreate it. And that was really it. I mean, I don't feel like I did anything special in the beginning. I just recreated what somebody else was doing and just kind of built in my own efficiencies that I felt were, were better than maybe what he was doing. Cause I learned a lot too, like a lot of what not to do when I was working with him. Yeah. Well, you hit on a ton of great things there and that was, that was powerful. That's there's not, you said 90% of the people won't do it. I, from what I've seen, it's 99% of the people will not do the work <laughs> They're They don't have that big why, um, or they think they may have it, but they don't have the drive or the determination or, Whatever, there's a combination of things. Um, no, that was all great. So you went pretty big on your first deal. Most people, as I run into, they don't start with a 50 unit. Obviously, you worked for this guy for a year and a half. I'm guessing you got some confidence from that, but what made you think, like, yeah, you know what? I can do a 50 50 unit deal uh, for the first I think <laughs> sheer craziness. <laughs> you know, I mean, I look back at it now and I'm like, what was I thinking? You know, but back then I just I think, you know, I wouldn't say desperation, but I was so hungry for a life change. I was so hungry for, you know, just to get on a path that I knew would lead to something better that I was willing to do anything. And and yeah, I think, you know, again, my background, I had a lot of construction background. I knew how to do drywall flooring, swap outlets, change toilets. Like I knew how to do a lot of the work. So that didn't scare me. Um, 
I will say it was quite an event to try and getting it funded because going from somebody who, you know, I, I, I will say this, I used the resume that I built working for Steve to go in and pitch lenders on why they should lend to me on this, you know, it was $1.7 million purchase. I've never owned rental property, you know, like I had to, I had to get creative on, on building their confidence in me that I could execute. And the only thing that I really had going for me at the time was a resume that I had put together by working for Steve, you know? And so that was, that really helped me get the loan done. But even through that there, you know, I talked to six lenders and the sixth one finally said yes. And then they would only give me enough money to buy the property. So I had to go out and raise more private equity that I'd never done any of that before. Uh, you know, so it was, like I said, it was, I think circumstance, a little bit of crazy and a little bit of luck that was able to, to get it all, uh, to, to align. Um, but you know, I would not recommend people do that now. You know, like I said, looking back at it, there was probably 15 different reasons why that deal should have gone sideways. Uh, the first being, I didn't have enough. I went in undercapitalized. I had enough money to buy the property and had some money left over, but you know, I had somebody, again, another mentor. I had a guy in Cleveland who was a, he had been a firefighter. He had left the fire service, was doing full-time real estate, was doing multifamily, had about 750 doors at the time when I met with him. And he was the first person that I'd ever heard talk about leaving the fire service and your pension for real estate. And, and it, like I talked to, I have a conversation with him. And then after that, I was like, holy cow, like this could be, this could be way bigger than I ever imagined if you do it right. You know? And so calling him after we closed was, I, you know, I had a lot of guidance from him initially just saying like, Hey, here's what you need to do. Or here's, you know, some kind of, um, landmines to avoid. And, you know, again, it helped with my confidence to know that I was at least heading down the right direction. But, you know, I, I think again, confidence in myself, I knew that, you know, that not only this had to be successful because I owed somebody else money and I gave them my word that I would pay them back and that this was going to work. But, you know, if it didn't work, it was going to bankrupt my family because we, I, I, you know, I wasn't at a point where I could lose a hundred grand and, and then get foreclosed on and have all that happen. So it, you know, it was not easy. I mean, I would work at the firehouse. I'd get off at seven in the morning and I would drive straight to the property and I'd be there for 12 hours working, Crazy. you know, and I, I did a ton of the work, but it also got, you know, immediately after we bought it, 15 people moved out. So I went from being 95 to 96% occupied to like 75 and immediately the project got way bigger than I could handle by myself. So I had to pivot, start hiring some contractors, having to kind of oversee, you know, the pro, you know, kind of go more of a project management role than actually doing the work. Uh, but you know, like I said, that's, yes, I was bold and believed in myself to make the first move and buy something like that. But, you know, I, I would say I was accidentally successful in full transparency, you know, it worked out, but I've seen a lot of other deals not work out for people that have more experience than I did. And so I'm just blessed that it, that it went the way that it did. Yeah. Well, I think we're, we've all been in deals where like that, where it's like lucky to get through that deal. Um, <laughs> But you said something um, that that is huge. I don't think a lot of people really think about. It's easier to look back, right, than forward. But you were able to find a former fireman that retired. Sound I sound like he retired as fireman. Yeah. Um, multimillionaire real estate investor. So you saw yourself in him in a way that helped you gain confidence and believe, like, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. We we walked a similar path. I could do the same thing. I remember, I think it was like 20, I don't remember, 2016, 17, something like that. I had like two or three rentals and I had met a guy that's local to us um, for lunch one day and he was still working nine to five. Um, it was like a year or two after that, he ended up leaving his nine to five through rental income. And I'm like, I think that was the first time where I was like, this is act an actual possibility. Like I could actually leave my nine to five through rental real estate. Like, obviously you hear about it and you've seen people do it, but someone that's walked a similar path to you that's done it is just, I don't, I don't know. Like my belief just went through the, through the roof at that point. I'm guessing, you know, you kind of had a similar uh, journey there. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, and I drew a lot of, com or I shouldn't say confidence. I drew a lot of what you just said through listening, like in the early days when the bigger pockets was somewhat newer mm -hmm. and there was no other, you know, now there's like, 20 different shows, but when it was the original one and it was the only one, you know, I would listen to that all the time. And it was like hearing these people that were normal people 
executing on deals. There's a lot of them doing single family stuff, but I really honed in on people that were doing, you know, six units, eight units, 10 units. And they always talked about how, you know, one roof, 10 doors, one, you know, one water heater or, you know, all these different things, the economies of scale, like that really resonated with me because I thought, man, like that, that, why, why would you go any smaller than that? Like, why would you not just jump right into that if you could? And and again, hearing their stories, going to the real estate meetups and hearing those people's stories, you know, meeting Jack, who is a, he was a firefighter up towards Cleveland, you know, like meeting, talking with him and hearing his story, like all of those things gave me the confidence to know, like, man, these are all normal people that took really big action, calculated risk, and look at how it's changed our lives, you know? And, and that's, like I said, for me, a lot of people get the analysis paralysis or they're afraid of it. How I got through that was working for Steve, right? I mean, like I was able to learn and and be in the field doing it and see like if there was a loss that happened, he took the loss. But if he, if there was a gain to happen, he took the gain. And I could kind of see like, I, you know, I guess I got the, I got the butterflies out of my stomach. I got the, the disbelief out of me realizing that if all these like normal people can do this, I'm just, how, why can't I, you know? And like I said, I just believed in myself enough to know that, that I would die before I failed. Uh, I think that, that really helped me to jump into, into a bigger deal. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Bigger pocket, bigger pockets podcast changed a lot of people's lives. It's amazing how many people I talked to and granted we're all somewhat the same age, but most people I talk to in an interview, it sounds like they start around 2014, 15, bigger pockets podcast. And it's like we all kind of have the same traje trajectory, which is cool. So um, if you don't mind, if you do mind, no problem. But can you break down the 50-unit deal as far as you told us the purchase price? Sounds like you raised money. What it looked like? Um, how much money did you make? Are you able to share any of those specifics? Yeah. So we we paid $1.7 million for it. Um, we bought it in – did I buy that? 2016, I believe. And then – you know, it was a 50, 50 deal. I split with the other investor. He brought, I mean, probably 350,000. I threw in hundred K and then the deal was that I would run everything. Um, we, the week before we closed, the bank came back and said, Hey, we knew we were going to do an 80, 20 on your loan. So 80% leverage. I was bringing 20%. They're like, we need to do 75, 25. So I called Steve and I'm like, Hey, I need to come up with like 75,000 more dollars in four days. I don't have any, what do you, what do you, think I should do. Well, he connected me to a hard money lender that he had known. Was a, he was a private money, private lender that had hard money rates, put it that way. Hmm. And I met with those guys again, just pitched to my idea, gave them my resume, talked to them. They believed in me enough to be able to do it. I paid, they, they lent me 75 K at 12% interest and two points up front seemed extremely expensive to me at the time. Um, but I was like, there was no other choice, right? I was closing this thing. And I knew that if I could refinance it in, you know, 12 to 18 months that we would be okay if the plan executed correctly and I could pay them back. So, you know, that, that right there alone, finding a lender that would do with the loan was, was good. Finding them was great. Uh, we bought the property. Uh, like I said, it was 95% occupied originally. Uh, all, how'd you, how'd you find it? Interestingly, I found it through a realtor. And what I did was, I printed off like buying criteria and back then it was pretty elementary, but I went to every real estate office in my area and I just said, Hey, if you guys have anybody that comes in here with a deal of this size mm -hmm. with this kind of buying criteria, call me because this is what I'm looking for. And within two weeks, a lady called me and she said, and she's a residential realtor and she had a long-term uh, client of hers, which him and I have actually become really good friends over the years. And I've bought in two other properties from him, um, all big multifamily stuff, but he was looking to, to sell a property and, uh, and that she called me, she's like, Hey, I got your list of stuff you're looking for. I got a guy here that's looking to sell, you know, are you interested in this? So I went down there and looked at it again, had no idea what I was really looking at. I mean, the way we do due diligence inspections now is 10 times different than the way I did it back then. I showed up with a notebook paper and a pen and mm -hmm. was started walk units, you know, but you know, so we, 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 that's how I found the deal. We closed on it, went from 95% occupancy to about 75%, found out that the guy that was, he was, um, he managed like three apartment complexes down there, but he had had a bunch of family living in the complex. So when we let him go, they all moved out. So that was lesson number one, that that actually happens. Uh, lesson two on buying it was that I never did any kind of lease verification. So I looked at the lease and said, oh, you're collecting this amount of money every month. Great. I built out a pro forma based on that. And then when it came to the first months of actual collections, 
they realized that he was only collecting about three fourths of what the leases said, and he wasn't worrying about the rest of it. So that was a you know that was a big hit, uh, you know. So we bought it, found out all this stuff. I called Jack. I'm like, what do I do? You know, we got 50k in the bank, and he's like, you don't have anywhere near enough money to to renovate this thing and do it. Because again, I my plan was to do it unit by unit, out of cash flow and and supplement out of the money that we had. Um, but we went to having like 15 vacant units immediately. And I barely had enough money coming in to pay the mortgage and the other bills, let alone do any renovations. So he's like, you got to go out and raise more money. So I immediately started talking to other guys that I knew in the fire service. And uh, two of the guys I worked with on different crews get, lent, loaned me money. And then the parents to a guy that I used to work with at a different firehouse, he had transferred out. Uh, his dad ended up loaning me money. Mm -hmm. And those were the three big investors I had in the beginning. They were they just did a personal, like a uh, promissory note, like a personal note to me, uh, had no equity in the deal, but based, based on my work ethic and the integrity they knew I had, they lent me the money, which is crazy to look back on, but it was 125 grand total between the three of them. Mm. Um, you know, we just got to work. Uh, we started renovating it was 24, one bedrooms and 24, two bedrooms. We just, you know, I said, I spent every day there that I was at the station and it, I will say that if I hadn't been there that much, the deal would have went sideways because the management company was okay, but they weren't capable of handling a uh, unstable property. And it was, I mean, it was probably, you know, it's a C-class building. It's probably a B-class now, like with us owning it, which was great because I love the location of it. And I knew you could make it whatever you wanted. Um, so that was, you know, that was key was buying in the right area. Uh, but, you know, they they could not have handled the management side and then the renovation construction side especially when all these units opened up they just weren't structured for that so i learned that pretty early on that most management companies even if they tell you they can handle renovation and construction they can't handle more than a couple units at a time or you know what we consider light turns you know they can't do any kind of like real heavy lifting um so that was that was you know it was way more time intensive than i thought um we you know commercial real estate is based the value is based off the net operating income and so I knew that there was, I knew going in, there was ways for me to increase that, not only through rent increasing, but through like laundry income and, and some various things that they weren't taking advantage of. And so we started implementing those. I was, you know, overseeing contractors directly when I was down there. Uh, you know, put it this way, the, the, the place needed new windows. So my stepdad flew up from Arkansas and we spent two weeks, basically 12 hour days installing windows. We, I demoed, it was 136 windows in the complex. I demoed every one of them. And the two of us reinstalled them all and finished them over like a four month period. Wow. But I became an expert at installing windows uh, after that was over. But things like that, where, you know, being able to jump in and do what needed to get done to be, make it successful was huge. Yep. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that was really it. So we, we did all those things. Rents were like two or 300 below market. We got the rents up, um, got a lot of the CapEx done. Um, it didn't cost us nearly what it would have had we hired it all out because we were doing a lot. You know, I still did a lot myself. Um, but I, you know, I'd be working in one unit and I'd have contractors in two or three other units. So on average, we were turning five units a month, which I look back now is pretty phenomenal that we were doing that many. Uh, but every time we would get done and I thought, Oh, I can take a breath. Five more would open up. Then five more would open up. And so in a year we had, we had hit 40 of the 50 units. Jeez. It was crazy. Um, but when we refinanced, you know, that was the, really the big thing I would say is that all of this was theoretical you know my wife I'm, we're still married to this you know still married now right but in her mind and in my mind it was theoretical she's you know she hadn't listened to all the podcasts and the youtube videos and and met with all these people like i had and it was it wasn't until we actually got to the refinance where you know the new appraisal came in we paid 1.7 million we probably had 200,000 in which you know was probably way more if we had hired it all out but we had about two you know so we were all in for 19 and then appraised for 29 Wow. So, I mean, in 14 months is what how long it basically took us before we refinanced. You know, we made all this appreciation, new equity. I mean, that's more money than I was going to make in, a, in 10 years at the firehouse that mm -hmm. I was working at. You know, I mean, I did very well there, but, you know, my my cut of that, I was able to pay back my equity line of credit, pay off all the private investors, you know, and the money that I took from there, you know, I could have spent it, bought a new car, bought a new truck, really bought a new boat. You know, most of the firemen, that's what we, you know, they're all got, you go to the fire station, there's all new trucks, boats, whatever <laughs> in the back, in the back. But I took all that money and I bought another apartment complex and I started over again doing, doing the same thing. And that was really the start of our company and, and 
the life changing things that we got into because I recognized that this is possible, that it's real, right? It's not just for somebody else on a podcast or somebody else on a YouTube video or, you know, some other person at a, at a uh, real estate meetup in Columbus. It's, this is actually for me. And, you know, here we are now at a couple thousand apartments and ground up construction and all kinds of craziness going on. And, and, but yeah, that was, that was the, the start of us and the first deal. Yeah. And that, that's absolutely inspiring story. It's, uh, I mean, you're, you're just a person that is willing to get things done no matter what it takes, right? Like you spent a year of your life. I mean, I can't imagine how little you were home at that point in time. Um, but you saw that it was going to pay off at some point. Um, and obviously it did, which is, yeah, that's absolutely inspiring. So from there, uh, it sounds like this is, is this your partner now that you built a, your current? No. So I, so I, I the, after the second apartment complex that I got into, so now I had about a hundred doors. Um, I own 50% of the first deal. I own 70% of the second deal. And, you know, so about a hundred apartments at that time. And I actually, one of the guys that I was mentoring was a fireman here in Columbus. He was like, Hey, you know, I know another guy that's big into real estate. He's like the smartest guy. I know you guys should get along. You guys should meet. And so I ended up meeting him and, you know, we had uh, probably two or three meetings where we got together and chatted about his past experience with, cause he was, he had originally started off as a house flipper, got burned on a couple of flips and then had gotten into commercial real estate. He actually worked for a commercial brokerage here in Columbus for a while, while he was still a fireman. Uh, and he had been looking to get into bigger stuff. And, you know, that was, that was really kind of where we bonded because I recognized how smart he was. I recognized that we really, all of our interests aligned and in, in the way that we work aligned. And so we, you know, we kind of decided, you know, over coffee, we're like, look, you know, we can, we can do this independently, but if we were to join forces and do this together, like we, we could, it's like putting gasoline on this thing. And, and mm -hmm. with his knowledge of contracts and negotiations and all the acquisition side and the debt structuring and all the stuff that he learned while he was brokering, you know, coupled with my real world experience, if you will, because that's what the lenders wanted to see. The lenders wanted to see somebody that had real world experience. So now we had like the, the, the two superpowers because I'm by no means a spreadsheet guy. I can't stand it. You know, like I, I know enough. I, well, I, I know what I, I know what I need to know to, to be effective, mm -hmm. but I hired out. If I've got to underwrite a deal, somebody else does it. Then they bring it to me that we review it. And then I'm, I'm a yes or no. Um, you know, I, the construction budgeting and all the things that you have to, you know, We've just we've got quality people on our team now that do all that, but that was one thing that he did very very well when we met, and I didn't. So again, I recognized one of his really big strengths was one of my biggest weaknesses, and you know it was just it, that's how we ended up partnering up. So once we did that, the you know we we scaled pretty quickly. Um, you know, some would say that it's probably too quick, but you know we 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 started to scale. We got to a size we thought, hey. You know, we wanted to, we all had bad experiences with man, third party management companies. So why don't we, you know, we had this bright idea one day. We're like, Hey, we should start our own management company. <laughs> and then we went through two years of craziness to try to get that to be effective um, while managing, you know, about 600 doors back then. And, you know, it, it, it like, it, it's just interesting because again, when I would, when I would struggle and do things at the firehouse, it was always for somebody else. I wasn't building my own thing. And now it's like the long days are worth it because in the end I, I'm, I'm, we're building and we've built something that like when my kids get old enough, they can work in the company, you know, they can, it will be a real thing. And so that's, what's exciting to me. It makes those longer days uh, less brutal, I should say, but yeah, that, that was, that was how we started to scale. You know, I got those two complexes done, had successful um, refis. I still own them to this day. They cash flow very well. Uh, you know, and then, we just said, I said, Hey, I want to, I want to keep doing this, right? My money's tied up. I still got money tied up in both of these deals. And if I want to keep doing it, um, that was kind of when we decided to syndicate. What's uh, what's your portfolio look like now? Uh, so we've got, a, we, we just sold some stuff off. So we got about 1800 apartments. Uh, we've done some ground up stuff for traditionally multifamily. We've got some, uh, there's actually a third partner now that came in a couple of years ago that had a lot of ground up development experience. And he's got a ton of uh, mixed use. So he's got commercial on the bottom, multifamily on the top. Uh, that's primarily what we do. Um, we've tried to get into some kind of flex space stuff uh, that, that we ended up, we spent a year on that deal and ended up having to pause it. Mm. Uh, so we, we were still, I would say 95% multifamily. Um, but we're working on a big development that's uh, here in central Ohio. That's 
650 doors right now. And on that property, it's got multifamily, it's got patio homes, it's got residential houses, it's got senior living, there's a daycare uh, zone, we got zoning for daycare on part of it. So again, we won't build all of it, some of it will sell off. But, you know, we just, as we've, as we've been through the ringer, I say on some of these C class properties and doing this value add and doing all that stuff, it's very time consuming. And sometimes the time spent isn't worth the upside or the risk that you take on by doing those. So we've kind of pivoted to some different things and, and doing ground, doing more ground up is one of them, because as you know, in central Ohio, you know, we're at a five year all time low for housing production. The, the Columbus is only growing at an exponential rate. And it's the, the sh housing shortage is only going to get worse, which is going to drive up rents, drive up home prices. And so for us, you know, we've had the opportunity to pivot into some ground up development out uh, in central Ohio. So that's what we're, you know, we're closing, well, we're closing on a 42 unit. So a smaller deal for us uh, next, what, two weeks from now. And then, like I said, we got a, the, the ground up deal we're working on is, is a pretty massive project for us. It's the largest to, the, to date that we've done. That's awesome. When'd you, when'd you leave, uh, when'd you quit or retire being a fireman? Uh, I retired officially on the books in 22. So I did it. I hung out for a long time and, and what really freed me or what really made it work for us was that Tim was also a fireman and we were on different unit days. So in central Ohio, we call it unit days. Some people call it like a shift, B shift, C shift. We call it one unit, two unit, three unit. Um, he was on, uh, what was he on? He was on two unit. I was on three unit. So when I was at the firehouse, he was off. When he was at the firehouse, I was off. And then there would always be one day where we were off together. So we were able to continue to keep this thing moving forward, even though neither of us were leaving our careers yet, because I, I didn't have enough, um, you know, I really didn't have enough income coming in yet to leave that steady flow of income, um, you know, because everything I was doing was getting dumped back into the properties or into the portfolio or trying to buy more stuff. And it wasn't until we really started the management company where, you know, we got big enough with that where we had to start providing benefits to the to the employees. So we got insurance, 401k, like we got all the, you know, vacation, sick leave, all that stuff. So I was able to tag on to the insurance. So that, that was covered because obviously the kids and the wife, you know, you want to have insurance. Um, so those were some of the, like the things that we had to do. We were always planning on leaving, but it just took me longer to get out than I thought it would. Um, and I really, I mean, I love the job. I love the guys I work with. And interestingly, you know, I continued like, as I would go in in the morning, sometimes I'd always be like, you know, it's costing me money right now to go in because I couldn't access the depreciation. I couldn't be a real estate professional. I couldn't benefit from all the amazing things that come with owning real estate because I'm still have this W2. And so, you know, that was weighing on me. Uh, I was at the firehouse, but my mind was on real estate. My mind was at the properties. I was taking phone calls for the portfolio. I was doing different things where I was, while I was at the firehouse. So I was kind of torn, you know, I kind of felt like Superman where you're Clark Kent at the firehouse and then you're Superman when you're not there. And it's like, a, it just was, it was a struggle. Uh, but ultimately what made the decision for me is I got, I injured my back in 21, uh, had surgery that I ended up having enough surgery again in 22. And that ultimately put me out. So when I retired, I retired, I retired with a pension because of my medical status. I couldn't do the job anymore, whether I wanted to or not. The, the, the surgeon was like, you gotta be done. So again, thankfully I had real estate already going for me because if I didn't have that and this happened, you know, the, the, whether I was choosing to leave or not at one point you know, the choice was made for me because of my back. Right. And if I didn't have these things already in the works, I would be, it'd be pretty tough right now, you know? And, and I mean, I have a college degree, but my degree is in, in emergency management. So all of my studying and my schooling had all gone towards being a first responder. And it's like the military, you know, when you get out, a lot of the things that you are an expert at in that field don't translate into the real world. And, you know, so for me, my only option would have been to go be a, uh, like an EMS instructor or fire instructor or do something like that, where, you know, you're again, that's not life changing money and you're not out of the rat race. So thankfully I had, I had already had a plan in place and was working on it, but yeah, 2022 was my official last day on the books in Ohio. Got it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. What's your team look like now? Obviously you've got what, 1800 units development, a lot of things going on. Yeah. So we've got. We've probably got 30 employees on the payroll. So I mean, we have we have a civil engineer that works for us directly. We have a asset, a chief asset officer that had 25 years experience in ground up development and and of multifamily and overseeing really big projects in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, you know, we have two uh, two bookkeepers. We have a whole accounting group. We have two guys that work remotely for us that do a lot of our 
um, financial auditing and they do a, a bunch of our, we're very data driven. So like even with our management folks, all of our work orders, we, we like, I'll pull up every Monday, we pull them up. We look at a dashboard of like, how many work orders did we have? How many people, you know, did it take to get the work orders done? How long were they logged into that work order? Like we look at all the numbers and we can tell, do we have, do we need to hire another maintenance guy? Do we have too many maintenance guys? Do we have leasing agents? You know what? We have a whole system to it now, but yeah, there's about 30 people that, that make up the team. Uh, and then there's three of us that became like, you want to call them the, the general partners, mm -hmm. but each as we scaled and got bigger and, and Tim and I got into bigger deals, you needed somebody with a bigger net worth and liquidity option to come in and some of those bigger loans. I mean, like the development we're doing, I'd never be able to qualify for it on my own. Uh, you know, but we paired up with somebody else who's done big ground up like this before. Mm -hmm. And so the banks take a serious, the seller took a serious, we were able to close on the deal. Uh, you know, and, and so the three of us together, you know, we're, we make up three of the 30. So there's probably 27 actual employees, but you know, that's, that's been really key on scaling is, is I think identifying your weaknesses and finding people that can fill those, fill those holes. And, uh, it's allowed us to do really well. That's cool. Obviously your roles, role roles have changed over the years. What's your roles? What's your major role now? Uh, I would say just project oversight as a whole, um, you know, investor relations and talking and dealing with investors. And then I, I think that the biggest thing that I do is put the plan in place from a high level uh, overview. So like we got, our company got hired to take over two projects in Illinois that um, were in foreclosure when we got called by the guy that had been the loan guarantor. And, you know, we were friends with him and we said, Hey, look, we'll, we'll help you out. But like that stepping in and taking over a project like that, identifying where it's failing, why is it failing? You know, bringing in resources and solutions to those failure points, shoring that up. And then, you know, ultimately putting the plan together and then making sure that it's executed correctly with the right players is probably my biggest role. I mean, that's, primarily what I do now. And then, like I said, deal with investors and, and uh, having, you know, calls with those folks. If investors want to talk to somebody, they always seem to want to talk to me uh, unless they're personal, personal friends with somebody, you know, with one of the other Tim's cause it's myself and two other Tim's uh, you know, they, but ideally they, they always want to talk to me. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, and I enjoy that. So that's kind of been my role, even like doing podcasts like this, you know, it's, it's kind of what I do for the team to bring awareness and, and to meet other people in network. For sure. No, it's great. Very inspiring story. So I've got basically kind of three podcast questions here. Um, and and it's funny because I think I say this probably most shows, but after learning about everyone's journey, I can probably answer at least this first one pretty well, um, sometimes better what the guests can. But what's uh, what's one thing that you're better at than everyone else? Mm. Well, I'll say I'm probably better at public speaking and or in like, doing these kinds of things or, or meeting investors and, and, and them believing in what we're doing. And in me, I guess, like I probably do that better than anybody on my team. I won't say I do that better than anybody, but on my team, that's the reason why I do it is because the other guys don't want to do it. They're, they're, they're more shy. They like to be behind the scenes. And, you know, I think that that's probably on, on our team. Um, everybody that's ever invested with us has some type of, tie to me directly. So whether we knew each other before or they met me or they heard your podcast and then they called or reached out through the website or whatever. So it, it I'd say on, on our team, I probably do that better than anybody. That's cool. That's cool. That's a new one too. We haven't had that answer. What's uh what's next? Uh, right now we're trying to, we, you know, we have a five-year plan to integrate our construction and some other things into the, the business so that we kind of have like five different streams of income coming into the core business. Uh, you know, I, I've, we've kind of pivoted from a lot of people were like, again, when in the same way I was, when you get into real estate, you're like, man, I'm going to create generational wealth by building, buying this building. And then, you know, it's like you buy the first one and you execute the plan. Then you're like, okay, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. You know, and then you kind of, okay, I want to get into this next one. And so it has, you know, real estate has now become the widget that we use to grow the bigger underlying business, which is the management company, the investment company. You know, we've got two funds that we're, uh, in the process of taking money on for ground up development and, and multifamily in central Ohio. So like we're, we're building, you know, these other things that, that all feed and, and service the the main thing, which are the properties, but we're, because we're doing it this way, I feel like we're able to give a better 
you know, a, a better well-rounded investment to somebody. So like if you put your money in with us, you know, we're we're seeing it through from the time of acquisition till disposition all the way through it's with our team where a lot of folks don't do that. They, you know, a lot of people talk about acquisitions and raising capital and buying these deals. But then after they do that, they give it to a third party property manager. Mm -hmm. But the, the downside is that property manager wasn't involved in your underwriting. They weren't involved in your planning and they're, they're not aligned with you because they're a for-profit company. So they don't care if your investors get paid. They don't care if they deposit any cash flow into your bank account. They don't care what your pro forma and your spreadsheets say. They're running the property as expensive uh, as some of them are like, they, it just doesn't matter to them, you know? And so I think that's what's next for us is just continuing to fine tune the machine that we have going and then continuing to add things to it that just make us better, more well-rounded and, and really to get to the level that we want, you know, we kind of like, uh, if you want to, you know, talk about a vision board or, or like long-term goals, I've kind of said to the team, a, a billion dollars of assets under management is, is the goal for us. And you can't get there without having these key things in place. And, you know, like I said, right now we're working on the construction side of, of we have a construction company that we do all of our own renovations in the units that we, the buildings we buy, but we're trying to get to a point where, you know, try, we're investigating now, like, does it make sense for us to have a construction company big enough to where we actually do the full ground up development? I mean, right now it doesn't make sense, but that's kind of one thing that we're working on because Mark, who's our chief asset officer came from a company of 1200 employees and that's what they did. So they handled everything. I mean, everything in house insurance, buying and selling. I mean, they did everything. And so that's, you know, he, he's really brought that vision to us of like, you know, we, we could really expand on what you guys have built thus far and really make it something great. So it that's probably what's next or at least what we're going to continue to work on. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. So I'm sure people have questions. Uh, obviously, you've got uh, you, you take on money and syndicate and all that. Where can people find you? Uh, so they can look me up on social media. I mean, Seth Teagle is, you, know, you can find me on Facebook. We're, I'm on Instagram. Uh, we were, we were heavy on TikTok for a while, but I've kind of pared that down, but you can still find our account on there. Um, LinkedIn, uh, or they can just reach out to our website, which is uh, www.thestreamgroups.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, appreciate you coming on here. Dropped a ton of information, such an inspiring story. And um uh, Again, appreciate you coming on. We'll see you guys Absolutely, next time. John. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for following, subscribing, and listening to this episode of the Do More podcast hosted by John Farling. To learn more or ask questions, go to l4investing.com. <laughs>